Hi, I'm Meredith, and this is The Service Design Show, and this is episode 210. Remember when everyone was hiring designer folks like crazy? Well, the tides have turned a bit. But does that mean that DesignOps is dead? Not according to our guest today. We're diving into the evolving role of DesignOps and how it's adapting to the changing environment. Hello, if you're new here, welcome to the Service Design Show, the show where we invite the brightest minds in our field and explore what's truly needed to design great services that resonate with people push businesses forward and honor our planet. Our guest today is Meredith Black, the director of design ops at Figma. Now, Meredith has a unique perspective on the world of design ops. She's not only built successful practices at Pinterest and Facebook, she also co-founded a massive community of design ops professionals. Can you believe this woman? almost became an FBI agent instead. I'm curious to see how that might have influenced her approach to solving design challenges. Today, she is here to give us the inside scoop on what's really happening in the world of design ops. From navigating economic downturns to fostering community in a remote first world. So in today's conversation, you are going to learn about how to adapt your design ops strategy to thrive in today's ever-changing economic landscape. You'll get proven tactics for building trust and aligning expectations with stakeholders, even when resources are tight. You'll also get actionable strategies for measuring your impact and demonstrating the value of design ops to your organization. And you'll get insider tips for fostering a strong design ops community, whether you're working remotely or in a hybrid environment. I have to say, I was blown away by how Meredith approaches relationship building at Figma. She's not only networking with designers, she's befriending everyone from engineers to the C-suite. Trust me, you won't believe who Meredith considers her most important allies at Figma. It's not who you'd expect. Whether you are a design ops newbie or a seasoned pro, you'll definitely want to hear how Meredith navigates complex organizations and builds bridges across teams. So grab a cup of coffee or tea for that matter, get comfortable and join me for an insightful conversation with Meredith. I'll be back at the end to wrap things up with some closing reflections. My name is Mark Fontaine and you are listening to the Service Design Show. Welcome to the show, Meredith. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, I think we've had a lot of your friends on the show before, isn't it? So many, so many. I was going down the list and I was like, friend number one, friend number two, friend number... I just kept going on and on and on. So thanks so much for having me I, with such a like great, amazing group of other human beings. It was around about time that we got you on the show. Um, I was, I was, uh, whenever I'm preparing notes, sort of a title or a, a gist of the episode goes through my mind. And for this one, uh, it's going to be Meredith, what's going on in the world of design ops? That's going to be, <laughs> that's going to be the gist of today's episode. Um, design ops, that's the thing that's dear to your heart that you're passionate yeah. about. Um, before we get into the weeds of that, maybe it's good to give, uh, some context of why you're in the position to talk about this topic? Sure. Um, I mean, is anybody really in the position to talk about any topic? I mean, that's really the question here, right? Um, so yeah, so I have been in some sort of operations role essentially my entire career. Uh, where things started becoming defined as design operations was probably around 2013, 2014. Um, and uh, there were a bunch of design firms that were getting bought up by a bunch of tech companies and banks in Silicon Valley. And as a result of that, folks like me who were on the agency side transitioned over into the tech, tech world and banking and Silicon Valley companies. And we all started to kind of channel the agency account director, producer type role 
and shift that into Silicon Valley. And so um, there are a bunch of us who did it. And so we started that and we've just kind of been building this ever since. Hmm. Um, on top of that, I have been running a design ops community called Design Ops Assembly for the last seven years. I co-founded it with a very good friend of mine who was running Design Ops at Spotify at the time. I was at Pinterest. We literally found each other on LinkedIn. We met in person. We asked, can we be friends? Started talking about all of the things that go on to being, you know, like what happens in our design works. And we were like, wait, what are you doing? What are you doing? All of these things. And over time, we started meeting more people who were doing the same role. Design leaders started being like, huh, what's this thing called design ops? And so they started like adding design ops people to their teams. We'd pull them in. Those people who started running design ops teams started being able to hire people to be on their design ops teams. And so we've been able to build this community of design ops practitioners all around the world. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's been a really awesome opportunity. So we've been keeping the community going. We've been getting all of the best, the best teaching what design ops is, how to be better at design ops. We have meetups, chapter groups, all of this stuff. And then on top of that, after building the design ops practice at Pinterest, um, I went out and started consulting with a lot of different companies, which was really fun and really cool to see what different design leaders are looking for and what they're doing. And now I am at Figma, um, where I am helping grow the design ops team there, where there was only one person on the design ops team before me at Figma. And so I'm there and uh, my colleague is there and we're helping to grow it and help show Figma what design ops is all about. Sounds like you eat, sleep, breathe design ops. Ah, uh, that is true. I'd say it's like an 80-20 split. 80 design ops, 20, 20 dogs, 20% mm. dogs and, and free time. But yes, definitely a lot of it. I couldn't imagine any other better person to tell us a bit more about what's going on in the world of design ops these days. Yeah, it's it's the it's wild. I'm I'm not going to lie. Tell us. I think I don't think that this is just with design ops. I think that this is with design and I think that this is with in like the industry as a whole. And so to kind of lay the land out for folks who are like, "Huh, what's going on with design ops?" I think there's like I think we need to set the stage here a little bit. And what I mean by that is Design ops was like becoming popular and kind of becoming this thing from like, you know, 2014 to 2019. There were a lot more people in the industry. There were a lot more design leaders pulling these types of roles within these companies and these organizations. But there was this really big turning point when COVID happened. And what happened is a lot of these design leaders, for better or worse, were like, oh, my goodness, I can't be in the office anymore. I don't know what's happening with my team. I can't keep tabs on things the way that I used to. And so they started hiring design ops people in droves to be like, okay, like, how do we do this? Like, how do we figure out what this remote world looks like? How do people, like, how do we build cultural people process, keep connections going, keep projects going, like all of this stuff when you're in a remote world, when we're only living in boxes now, little boxes, right? Little boxes. And so what happened is that, or at least in the United States, and I'm assuming this happened globally as well, is that a lot of these companies got very overconfident in terms of hiring. In terms of, oh my gosh, this is going to happen. Our numbers keep going up. Our stock keeps going up. Like everything's like, everything's golden. But what nobody was anticipating was that the financial market was going to go down. And what I mean by that is that interest rates started rising, which means that companies couldn't borrow the way that they used to, which means that they couldn't hire the amount of people that they were used to hiring for this period of time. Other things started happening. You know, how do we define what the workplace is? Do we do we really need all of these people? You know, there was like all these kind of like aha moments with some of these CEOs that led to other CEOs being like, oh, we should do the same thing. Lots of different variables happened here. But what happened is that design got hit pretty hard. I think tech got hit pretty hard. And so what happened is a lot of people were like out of jobs and have been out of jobs. And I can say that I know a lot of designers, researchers, writers, and design ops people who are still out of jobs or who are taking major pay cuts to get into jobs because the market just wasn't what it used to be. And so, you know, a lot of people are out there saying, oh, well, design ops got decimated. I don't think design ops got decimated. I think design ops got hit just like a lot of other service oriented occupations got hit, right? When any company, starts scaling back or needs to start doing reductions in force or starts changing their business model, 
Naturally, the service the service side of the house gets hit the hardest. It's not just design ops people. It's the accountants. It's the HR people. It's recruiting. It's the sales people. It's all of these people who make these companies tick, right? And so I think the one thing to highlight is taking the focus solely off of one, one sole career and looking at the bigger picture that, yes, all of these things are happening and there are waves. You will see in history, there are waves. Like if you go back to the beginning of, well, maybe not the beginning, but if you go back to the early days of the stock market before the Great Depression, and you look at the history of where the stock market was at the Great Depression, and you look at it now, you're going to see it go up and down and up and down and up and down. But honestly, it always keeps going up. There's just blips in it. Right now, we're in a blip. We're in a very long blip. So what that's doing in particular, I think to designers and to design ops people is people are having hard conversations and leaders are like, wait, do we need this anymore? Is this like, is this applicable? If we've got AI right now, like, do we need design ops people? Do we need researchers? Do we need all of these design strategists and thinkers? I think the short answer is yes, absolutely. You're never going to replace these people. You're never going to be able to replace this human aspect of what the business is. But what does that mean? That means that I think in design ops, since these roles have taken a hit, and I will say they are coming back up. I'm seeing them come back up. You know, six, nine months ago, there'd be like maybe one or two jobs posting a week. Now we're seeing like 10 to 15. That's not enough to staff the thousands of people that have been laid off in the past year or two, but it's coming up. That's something that's better than one or two every week or every other week. So it's happening. It's coming up. It's moving. But what I think what's more important is how we need to adapt and how Everybody in every career is going to need to adapt. Technology is always going to be one step ahead of us. And so it's how do we use those tools to be our friends and help support us versus kind of going against them and being like, nope, we're not going to do this. We're going to do it my way. And so I think there's this mental shift and this adaptation about how we do our work and what we are mapping our work to now more so than we have before. And that's hard. That's a hard shift. But I think... You know, Bill Burnett said it once on 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 my podcast is like, wouldn't your job be so boring if you knew what you were going to do six years from now? And it's true. This is just another opportunity for us to learn and grow and build something even bigger and maybe even better. Was that long? That was like really long winded, but I was well, like, I, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, well, no, I'll keep on going. No, no, I have some questions for you around this. Um, mm hmm. You've already hinted upon a few things we could uh, unpack later on, uh, for instance, the role of AI. But um, before we get there, I would love to hear your perspective on some of the, um, the, most, uh, the most difficult or challenging or painful things that happened in the recent years during the layoffs. What, like, what were the hard conversations that the community maybe needed to have or is still having so how would yeah, you describe I mean, the, the state in which we are today we as the I, design community design ops community yeah i think the real like i think the hardest part and this is like this is the hardest conversation to have to be brutally honest is that there are so like it's like the design ops community did such a good job of selling the role of design ops and showing people the power of this role and how great this could be and how much impact that you could give at the same time, I think maybe we didn't do a good enough job of also saying that like this is a very thankless kind of role, right? Like you're always behind the scenes. You are you are here for the service of others, right? Like you like hence service design, right? You are here for the service of others. You are here to support other people. You are here to be behind the scenes and let other people thrive and let other people do good work, right? Like and I think one of the things that I have seen is that there's been such a wild amount of interest in people wanting to come into design ops. But what's happening is that those expectations aren't necessarily being set. People are like, oh, well, I'm just going to come into this and I'm going to do this job and I'm going to do great. And I'm going to get rewarded and like blah, blah, blah. But like, this is a hard freaking job to have. Like, this is a very hard job. This is not a gravy position, right? Like you are dealing with so much behind the scenes. And I think I think some people didn't expect that. And I think some people came into this role thinking, oh, this is going to be great. And they might have, you know, been, you know, part of that wave that got laid off. And now they're like, okay, well, now what do I do? Right. And so there's this kind of like identity crisis happening with like, what do I do? And it's not that you couldn't hack it by any means. It's just that like maybe this wasn't the right like fit for whatever reason. 
I think that's one part of it. I think the other part, which is also really interesting, is that like I think design leaders and companies started expecting way more out of design ops people than design ops people could even do, right? Like there are certain there are certain leaders in certain companies that were just expecting des- like one design ops person to do the role of several people, not realizing it was the role of several people. And then that person leaves and then they try to get a new person in and they can't replace that person because they're never going to be able to have that one unicorn again who could do the seven jobs. And so there's so much happening right now, right? And so I think like I think between the recognition and realizing that this is just a really hard job to have and that it's not made for everybody, just like other roles, right? Like I'd probably be a terrible dentist, you know? But like also I think we have to recalibrate the expectations of design leaders and what is actually expected for these folks and who are you hiring and why are you hiring these folks and making sure that you're hiring the right people who do have the skill set. And if they don't have the skill set, making sure that you are committed to training this person to have that skill set and not leaving these people high and dry, starting a career, and then them having to go and kind of swim in the deep end by themselves. So can you give us an example? How are you, what have you learned from the past period on recalibrating expectations? You are in positions, in a position where you have a lot of influence. How are, you, how are you doing things differently maybe compared to five years ago, 10 years ago? I am, I'm way more vocal about it with design leaders. And I think because of the situation that I am in, thankfully so, like, I mean, just because of like building this community and being able to have the opportunity to meet so many design leaders out there and being able to build relationships with these design leaders is that like, I at least have the opportunity and I'm one of many who are able to do this, right? Like there's a whole group of people who are really trying to like, bang on the drum a little bit saying like, hey, like, let's recalibrate expectations. Let's see what we're doing. And let's let's see how we can shift this conversation and maybe set expectations up a little bit differently. Um, I also think it's sometimes it's just a really tough lesson for people to learn. You know, like you can go out and you can say all of this, but like sometimes some people just got to do it. Right. And so there are certain design leaders or certain companies who are going to do things their way. And that's OK. Right. Like, that's that's part of the ethos of that company. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just might be that like that person or that particular role might not be a fit for the company. And mm. that's okay too, right? And so this is not a very plug and play role. Design ops is like very nuanced. It's very nuanced. Tons of different companies see design ops as as different types of different types of roles, right? And so the more I think like there's some deep fantasy that I think a lot of us have of like standardized, standardizing this role to a point, right? Like making sure that like levels are consistent, making sure that comp is consistent, making sure that like the general expectations of these roles are consistent. But at the end of the day, everybody's working at individual companies and those companies have very, very different individual needs. And so I think I think it's kind of a partnership with whoever's coming in in this role or or this team whatever this team is, and the company to figure out what's going to work best for everybody. And at the end of the day, what's going to make people thrive and what's make, going to make people do their best work, which in their hope, like they're in, I hope will make the company do their best work and have the best output. Does that make sense? Did I describe that okay? I think so. But I, uh, we can follow up with this because, um, again, <clears throat> you're in a position where you can, like you said, every company is unique. Every situation is unique. It's hard to standardize. This role is different across anything. You're you're almost starting again, sort of on a new journey. How are you approaching? What kind of conversations are you having to make sure that you're able to uh, live up to the things you promise and manage these exp- can you take us into a room where you are having these conversations with your peers and your leaders yeah i mean right now is right now is like a really interesting time right i think for me personally um you know i i left pinterest i built design ops community or design ops assembly i was you know consulting a lot and i decided to kind of go back in house and one of the reasons i honestly decided to go back in house is that like i think there are a lot of people out there who talk the talk and don't walk the walk. And I think this happens in any industry, not just design, where people will go out and go to their speaking tours and go do all of this stuff and say they have all of this experience. But like, 
Some of these folks haven't been in the industry for, for a long time, and they're still talking about stuff that isn't relevant or that isn't accurate anymore. And for me personally, I felt like I got to a point that even though I was consulting and, you know, I was at the New York Times for a couple of years and I was like pretty embedded with them, but like I still felt like I didn't have... I still felt like I wanted to be in a little bit deeper to understand what was going in. So that way I could come back out and like output again, kind of what's happening again. Right. And so like, I feel like this phase in my career is that kind of like going back and getting the MBA like all over again. Right. And like kind of relearning how some of these organizations work post COVID, how some of these organizations, you know, work at, at this size, you know, with this type of, with this type of mentality. And so I think it's interesting. I'm in this learning phase, but I'm also in this, like, how do I advocate for this within a company like Figma, right? Like Figma is known as this, like, very, you know, amazing company, right? They have, like, they're very popular brand that a lot of the designers use their products. They have a massive conference that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, I should, you probably want to take that out because I don't know when this is going to air. By the time that we've like, published as the conference has, has yeah. stayed. Yeah. I was like, I was just going to say, you know, we have this massive annual conference every yes. year where 10,000 people show up at the Moscone Center in San Francisco to learn and hear from not only designers within Figma and, you know, experts within Figma, but also designers from all over the world. Right. And so it's this really unique company to be in right now. But I think the most unique thing about this company is that I'm, Design ops person number two there, right? They had one person running the show for the last two years, thank goodness. And now I'm there to help. And so I think part of it is being able to talk with these design leaders and also being able to talk with the rest of the organization about the power of what design ops can do, what the impact can do within design ops. And not just saying like, oh, what are we going to do within the design team? But hey, here's what we're doing in the design team. Maybe that there, maybe there are things that you wanted, that you might want to pull from that we're doing. Or maybe there are certain conversations that we're having that might spark up new ideas for you to have within other parts of the company to maybe run things a little bit, you know, differently or optimize a little bit differently or just have a different perspective. And so like design, right? Like like design, design is like always peppered everywhere, right? Like designers just don't sit in a design org. Designers change everything. They change how we bank. They change how we mop the floor. They change how we, you know, like you know, what apps we use, like designers change, designers have a huge influence on this world. And I think more so than people realize. And so I'm hoping what design ops can do is have the same, maybe not the same, a small sliver of influence on how organizations can run better and how organizations can optimize and be a better place to be if you can nail it within your design org. So it's an interesting place to be. I'm only three months in, so I can't say like everything's changed. And I think that there are a lot of amazing things that Figma are are doing great that I'm learning from, you know, and and learning about and 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 doing. And so I think I think right now I'm at the stage where it's more of a conversation, more building relationships, building trust, hearing people, listening to people, listening to what the needs are, not only within the organization but with on the team and and with the team changing and the team growth and bringing you know different people in and it's 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 a it's a very interesting place to be right now in terms of growth and so part of me is like sitting back absorbing it learning all of it taking in the fire hose and the other part of it is like okay once i get this information how can we start doing things that might even help improve things not only within figma but also like i don't know optimistically the product are there any things that you would do that you that you would do differently this time or are hoping to do differently this time compared to your previous design ops adventures any any key lessons that you took with you to this new role yeah i mean first and foremost relationships are the most important part most important part of of, the, of a design operations role like you need to build the relationships and you need to garner trust and you need to do it pretty quick um in order to make things move and happen i think the one thing, and this is kind of what I was saying before about like reaching out to people is like, I've become much more fearless and just reaching out to people within an organization. And Who do you reach myself. out to? I like sales, marketing, eng, product managers, HR, finance, like all of these people. If I see somebody in a channel and I haven't met them before, I'll reach out and be like, Hey, I'm so-and-so I'm, I'm new in design. You know, I'm working in design ops. I would love to know what you do more. 
Like, mm-hmm. I would love to know what your job is. I'd love to know, like, if we are going to work together, how we were going to work together. And, 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 you know, like, we have designer advocates at Figma. And that's something that I've never had before in any of my other roles. And so, like, I am trying to meet with the designer advocates to hear what they do, how they do it, how they work with people, how they're responding to people on Twitter. Like, what's their approach to things? I've only worked at companies before that have used advertising solely as their model to solely as a revenue model, right? Pinterest, Facebook, like New York Times, ad- advertising, advertising, advertising. Now I'm working at a company where it's a subscriber model, right? That's a whole different world that I actually don't know to like, you know, such an extent that other people do. And so like learning from these sales folks, learning like what's important, learning how they're working with clients who some of those clients are people I know in the industry, right? And so like kind of talking to them and, you know, hearing, you know, how they approach things and also me giving my advice being like, hey, I'm a person who's been at other companies who's had to buy sales or had to buy tools. Like this is how I would want to be talked to or this is how I would want to work with somebody or this is how I would spend my money and just kind of like transferring that education back and also learning what they're doing. So it's like these conversations, I think, are really interesting because I've never, I've never had them and I've never had the opportunity to have them. And so for me, I just think it's fascinating. And I think it's this really cool world where we can help each other out versus it being a one-way street, you know, same thing with finance. Like I will say this over and over again, and I've said this a million times, get to know your finance people. They're the ones who like give you the money for you to do the things that you want to do. Right. And so like, if they don't know what you're spending on and why, you're not going to get that money. And so if you just have these conversations with these folks and be like, look, you and I are going to be best friends. Like, I'm going to like, I'm going to tell you everything that I want to spend money on. I'm going to tell you the folks we want to sponsor or the things that are important to our team or the tools that we need. And here's why you are so much more likely to get a receptive answer and a thank you for telling me this. Because otherwise I would have just been like, no, you can't have X amount of dollars to do this. And so like building those relationships, I think, and doing this the, like doing this again and like coming into a company like this and being able to do this and being able to like really kind of step in like that, I think has been really important, but also really rewarding and getting that started at the start versus kind of like navigating and trying to get to it a little bit later. So building these relationships and you mentioned that it's rewarding. What makes it so rewarding for you? I think what makes it most rewarding is that like, again, Everybody at the end of the day is just a person. It doesn't matter who they are, what their name is, what their title is, where they sit in the company. What's important is like what drives them. And I think if you can understand what drives people and they understand what drives you, you're going to be able to do your best work and you're going to be able to help in situations that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise, you know, wanted you to think about or like asked you, asked you about. And so I think... I think that's I think that's what's the most rewarding part of it is just having the ability to meet other people and learn from other people in an area that I can say that I'm not well versed in. And so and doing it in a way where like people know that you're on their side and they're on their team and you're all working towards the same goal, right? And um I don't know. I'm just I'm a very curious person and I like to I I like to talk with people, but I also like to learn, but I also like to be like incredibly inclusive. And, you know, I think sometimes that can also be a blessing and a curse, right? Like sometimes it's like, nope, not make a decision. Let's talk to like these five people and then we'll make a decision. But I think sometimes if you get people on for the ride and you do it in like shorter increments, you're kind of like building these relationships as a whole that are going to last a lot longer and that are going to like you know, it's kind of like you're like setting up for a marathon of decision making and a marathon of like being a partner with someone versus being like, this is what I need right now. This is the decision I'm going to do right now. Mm. And so there's something about that that I look forward to of building those relationships and keeping them. It's like building the infrastructure to do, to enable you to later do good design ops, right? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Re- okay. So, We've explored relationships. Is there anything else that you're sort of, any other lessons that you're taking along with you? Oh, gosh. What are some of those make or break moments? What are things that give people uh, either an unfair advantage in building out design up capabilities or like things that people 
always stumble on. So I think the biggest thing is I think like it can be really easy to come like pretty heavy out of the gate, right? And be like, I'm going to do all these things. This is what I want to do. This is how we're going to do it. Or like, I've seen it this way. And I think like, I think that one of the things that really excites me most about joining Figma is that like Figma as at the size of a company, actually Figma is a lot larger than Pinterest was when I joined, but like Figma is like Figma's design team as, you know, at a size that, that was similar to Pinterest's when I left, right? And I think what's really exciting about that is I saw all of these growing pains at Pinterest and I saw like what we did and how we did it and what the approach was and what worked and what didn't work. And I think what excites me the most about coming in now is that I can take those experiences and be like, hey, we tried it this way, didn't work. Or hey, I see what's about to happen. Let's take a step back and let's look at things like, like let's look at things in a different lens and let's be a little bit more strategic about how we do things because the last time I did this, we weren't as strategic and this was the result. But if we do it this way, we might get a better outcome. And so not being like, this is how we did it at Pinterest all the time, because like that doesn't help anyone. But taking some of those learnings and being like, and, and not just at Pinterest, at all of these other companies that I've consulted along with the way, and you know, all of this stuff is being like, seen it done like this, it's either worked out really well or it really hasn't worked out really well or somewhere in the middle. Maybe we try something like this and then we modify it and doing stuff like that. So I think like bringing that experience and making sure that like Figma kind of has like a, like a step up and maybe not doing something wrong or failing at something is great. I think the other thing is that like don't put process in for process sake. Like I, I know I'm a design ops person saying this and like you're the I'm the first person that's going to tell you I love a spreadsheet and I love process and I love to like be type A. But I will say like don't come in guns blazing. Don't come in you know being like this is how we're going to do it. This is the only way to do it or like I'm implementing this and telling people what to do. Again, this goes back to relationships. Work with people, understand what the problems are, see if there's a solution for this. Maybe things are working really well. Maybe you don't want to touch something that's like not broken. And so observing I think is really important observing and not implementing too quickly unless unless you see something that is a quick fix right and so like i'm not saying don't do anything i'm saying do things thoughtfully and carefully and because they're going to make impact and because they are going to make things move forward don't do things for the sake of just doing things all right so here here's an interesting uh, observation it sounds like you are in a position where you have somebody who hired you who has the patience and confidence and trust that this is going to contribute to value later down the line. We also, at the start of our conversation, mentioned that there's growing pressure on sort of showing your value, measuring your impact. How do you see these things? Like the slow or slow progress but consistent progress versus showing immediate impact and results so i think there's a difference i don't i i think maybe what i'm not i i didn't mean to say slow progress i i think i meant to say like thoughtful progress right like i think there's a difference between going in guns blazing and being like this is how we're going to do it i don't consider that progress it could be progress, but that's not necessarily always progress, right? That could be like, you could make things worse. So I think in terms of adding value and adding value quickly, it's identifying what the needs of the team are and identifying a certain subset of what those needs are and focusing in on those first, not boiling the ocean with, I need to, I need to do 80 things right now. And so one of the things that I did when I first joined Figma was I did a listening tour and I met with a large majority of the people on the design team. And I met with a lot of like the cross-functional people who work with the design team. And my questions were, first and foremost, I wanna meet you. I wanna know who you are. I wanna know your backstory. I wanna know you as a person. Secondly, I wanna know what's working and what's not working. Third, I wanna know if you're a cross-functional partner, how could design be a better partner? What's like, what's going on with that? And then four is like, like, where do you see yourself? Like, like, what do you want to get out of this experience? And like, what do you want to get out of like, or, or what impact do you want to make as a designer or as a person of Figma? I took all of that information, just like, you know, researchers would be proud, took all of that information, you know, did the like IDO post-it method style and came up with four themes of things that I wanted to focus on. I talked with our head of design about them. 
Then I talked to our design leadership team about them. And then I talked to our entire design team about them. And at no given point did I change my narrative. It was the same narrative. It was head of design. Here's the heads up. This is what's going on. This is what I think we should fix. Design management, design leadership. This is what's going on. This is what I need to fix. Fast follow to the design team. This is going on. This is what we're going to need. This is what we need to fix. So this is what we're going to working on. Furthermore, adding, this is what we're going to do next. And then communicating with everybody what's happening along the way. I think a lot of times people get into these roles and they go into a corner and they're like, I'm going to fix all this stuff. And they don't tell anybody else what the heck is happening. And I think that's a big, I think that's a big area where you can improve upon, right? And be like, hey, if somebody's saying like, I think this is a problem, continue communicating with them and be like, hey, I know you think this is a problem. This is what we're doing. Or, hey, do you want to help me with this problem? Like, do you want to like, do, like, do you want to be a part of this with me? Like, do you want to like figure this out together? I think progress happens that way. I think if you go in, say, we've got these problems, this is what we're going to do. And then six months later, you roll, out, you roll out what you did and half the things you didn't accomplish or half the things you couldn't get to because you committed to a time frame that was like impossible, you're setting yourself up for success and you're not or setting yourself up for failure and you're, and you're not setting the tone for what you can do within your role and you're not building that time frame out. So I think there's a big thing between going slow and being methodical or being methodical and moving fast because you have the right tools and mechanisms in place and the right expectations to not only set for yourself, but to other people of what you're doing. Does that make sense? I hope so. I think so. Um, and yes, that there is a difference between slow versus thoughtful. Um, I, if we can zoom in on the expectations part. So how do what do you tell about what people can expect from you? How do you make sure that they don't confuse your role with the role of seven other people? Like, can you give us an example of the conversations that you're having around this? Yeah, I mean, so like, I think like, I think one example is, is, you know, like around like how we build a team, right? Figma is growing as a company and Figma's design team is growing as a result. And I think the one thing that I think we're all very cautious about is how that culture is going to change, right? When you go from five people on a design team to 25 people on a design team to 50 people on a design team, and you keep going, you keep going, and you keep going, change is inevitable. Change is going to happen. And I think that there are certain things that like you want to really try to preserve as your team and as your culture and like the ethos of the design team. But there's also things that are just naturally going to break and you need to change, right? And so... Having conversations like this, being like, okay, like what, like what does the future of this team look like? What do we want to preserve? What do we want to hang on to? You know, and looking forward and being like, okay, this company is going to look different in a year or two. Who are the type of people that we want to bring in? Who are the experts in some of this stuff that we're not tapping into right now, but that we need to tap into, right? And ha so having those types of conversations, I think, is really important. Talking with a leadership team and making sure that we understand that, like. The dynamics are going to change in certain ways. How do we want to address that? Like, how do we want to get more formal on things? How do we want to make sure that the team continues to have that fun spontaneity to it? You know, same thing with like approvals and processes, right? Like as the team gets bigger, it's not going to be the same approval processes. Things are going to get unclear. Things are going to need to be more defined, especially, you know, when you start having managers of managers, like who's the approver? Who really has the final say? You know, there's like a lot of these conversations that I think are happening right now that we're trying to like that we're trying to solve and um actually i i wouldn't say we're trying to solve i think we're trying to optimize right i think like all of this stuff's in place and i don't think there's anything broken it's just how how are we going to do things a little bit differently and how are we going to prepare and plan for the future so these types of conversations lend to other conversations that happen right it's like okay we're growing our team what does learning and development look on our look like on our team now that our team is growing so much? How do we continue to inspire our team on things that they might kind of, you know, be hard to be inspired about anymore? Or are we are we driving towards the same things and the right things? Like how do we how do we improve culture? How do we increase learning and development? Like how do we what do we want to how what do we want to decide we want to focus on as a team and as a culture and who we bring on to that team. I mean, th these are kind of like all of the kind of the conversations that I think are like, we're starting to have. But again, 
I'm only three months in, right? Like you can't, you can't change a lot. And I think in my position, and I think in any position that is a product organization that is driving towards like one of a few dates during the year where they launch things. And for us, that's config. Right now it's all hands on deck, right? Like config is an all hands on deck type of operation. There are a lot of people working to like get code frozen and be able to launch things. And there's all these people on the back end who are just trying to make the conference go and run. And so like figuring out who's going to speak at these conferences, figuring out like what the what the right topics are and who's experts on our team. And so there, there's all of this stuff. And so like right now I'm 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 in a lot of this stuff because it's it's, you know, config is is ever present. Right. And so it's hard to say like what I'm like, what, like, it's hard to say there's like one conversation happening now. There are many, many, many conversations happening now. I think all of these conversations are like tentacles of one thing, which is how do we set our, our design team to be successful, to be motivated, to do the best work that they can do and to build a good product. If you are having, if, if it's such a multi- disciplinary, holistic approach. And I totally see why it is and how it needs to be. At the end of the year, let's say it's uh, December 31st, 2024. What kind of conversation are you having with yourself to judge whether or not you've been successful this year? Like, if it's Yeah, that's a really good question. I think the first and foremost thing that I tell everyone that I need to do a better job of is you got to track all the stuff that you're doing and you've got to like screenshot things or like figure out what the big wins are and you track them. I think anybody in a design ops role is doing 9 million things always all the time. And there's so much happening that might not seem impactful now, but might actually be super impactful later on. Right. Like to be like, oh, like I did this, but then it turned into this and then it turned this. And then, you know, in December, you're like, wait, I did that? Like, you don't even remember some of this stuff. And so I think one of it is like doing a better job of journaling or tracking what you're doing. So that way you can take a look back and be like, oh, wow, I really did accomplish a lot. Or, oh, wow, maybe I didn't accomplish as much as I was anticipating. I want to get to the point where, you know, the relationships, I, I, I mean, I would love to get to the point where I'm able to grow my team, right? And grow my team and grow design ops and show that design ops has an impact and has a presence and that people want more design ops people on the teams to help them and to support them. That is like my goal. Do I want a large team? No, I don't. Like, I I, I don't think that I don't want to have people just to have people on my team. I want to have people who are going to make impact on my team and are doing it because there's a business need for it. And so whether that's growing people within my team to do things that maybe they hadn't done before or that we're trying different things out and it's working. To me, I think that's success. If there's the ability to bring somebody on because we have that need, to me, that's success. If there is the ability to get people within the organization to come to me more than they're coming to the head of design because they've never had somebody other than the head of design to like kind of rely on and to like, you know, ask all of these 9 million questions because, you know, he's been there for seven years and so everybody knows him. But to get more people to shift their attention and, and let me help him do all the, so he can do all the big and strategic stuff and like really work us on the focus on the quality of the work and all of that stuff. I find that to be success. So I think it dep depends how you find success and what you think that is. And I think that there's a lot of little wins along the way and there's a lot of big wins along the way. And I think as long as you have a mix of both, I think you're in a good spot. I also think that because we are in this remote world, things are not as easy as they used to be. And I will be the first to say that. I will be the first to say, it is so much harder building these relationships. It is so much harder garnering some of this stuff because you aren't in person and you can't just high five someone in the hallway. You can't go have drinks with them or go have lunch with them or like have that even same human connection of, oh my gosh, we live in the same neighborhood. We don't have that anymore. And so I think you have to give yourself a little bit of grace and a little bit of permission that some of this stuff is actually might take a little bit longer. That doesn't mean you can't make impact along the way. That doesn't mean you can't move fast. But some of the stuff just might take a little more effort than I think some of us, especially me, was expecting. And I think you just have to constantly remind yourself that that's okay. You are a human being. You, you like, There's only so many hours in a day. And I guess uh, we can circle back to the community aspect here. 
having people around you who are going through a similar experience yeah and just saying you know okay this is just the way yeah. it goes uh not setting unrealistic expectations towards yourself right yeah. are you seeing that happening in oh the community gosh of course like i mean it's it's funny it's like i i feel like sometimes like i feel like i can learn way more than the like to, i feel like i'm learning way more from the community than the community is probably learning from me right now right and i think that's awesome i love that i have this like resource i'm like pointing to my other laptop this resource of all of these people that i can tap at any time to be like hey do you have a document for something like this like what does this look like in your world how are you doing this and to be able to have those relationships and to be able to have those resources is the entire reason why we started design ops assembly in the first place and i think for so long like i was in the giving mode and now i'm in the receiving mode and I feel good about it because I've, I, I think that these relationships are very give and take. Like I, I'm very vocal on DOA. Like if you aren't going to, if you're just going to take, take, take and not give, why are you here? That's not community. You know what I'm saying? And so the fact that like, I feel like so many people are, are able to give back, you know, and like keep evolving and keep helping this and like keep growing other people, no matter at what stage in their career they are, I think it's just like, just such an amazing and fortunate resource. And I'm, I'm so, so excited to see how many people are so involved in it mm. and truly care, like truly, truly care. Right. How do you, how do you know? How, what, how, how does it show up in the world that they truly care? People volunteer, people volunteer to speak at things. People volunteer to run chapters. People volunteer, like what their levels look like, what, you know, like what, like what design ops job descriptions look like. People volunteer in terms of like what conversations happen for calibrations. People volunteer what their design teams are experiencing and what type of offsites they're doing. Like it is such an op, it's such a, there's so many people giving back because there's so many people who were in my position. 10 years ago in my position now mm. where they didn't have that knowledge. And once they got it, they started sharing it. And I think that those type of people keep the community going. Those are the types of people you want in your community. And those are types of the relationships that you have forever. I mean, I've met some of my closest friends from building this community. And some of them I meet all the time in person. And some of them I've never met in person. But it doesn't matter because they're like there and they're like a part of your everyday life. And they care just as deeply about a subject that you do. And, you know, there's always going to be people who just want, 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 right? But like, thankfully, those are still few and far between, in particular in this community. Hmm. And I think it's it goes to the ethos of the community showing up and the community being very vocal about what they want and what they expect out of this community. And it not just being myself and my business partner, Adam, trying to figure, like, just trying to be the ones that are like, don't cross post, right? Like no salespeople, like no biz dev efforts, like, no, we're not going to fill out your survey, no recruiters, you know? And like all of these other people are saying that as well and being mm -hmm. like, we want this to be a safe place. We want this community to continuing to have consistent quality conversations. And this is what we're going to do and the efforts we're going to take to have that. So maybe this is a good moment to go full circle. We started by looking at where design ops is coming from, that the origins, where it is today. Yeah. The question would be, where is it going to be tomorrow? Where do you hope maybe it will be tomorrow? I think tomorrow is a big question mark, just like any career in any role. Like what do you hope? Uh, what is your wish? My wish is that all design companies or all design teams around the world have some sort of design ops in place. I think this is, has been my wish. This will always be my wish that I think designers have way too much on their plate and are expected to do way more than just design. My hope is that more design leaders hear that and realize that and understand that there are folks out there that can support these designers and take a lot of stuff off their plates. We're paying designers to design. We're not paying designers to work on process and do operations and do all this stuff. That's not to say that I don't think designers or anybody should not do anything or say nothing is not their job. What I'm saying is that what are we paying our designers to do and what do we want them to focus on? And so I think whether it's one design ops person or a couple or just even better understanding what designers should and shouldn't be doing is like is my true dream. I still see a lot of companies who are expecting way too much out of their designers 
And I hope that that changes. I know that there are realities with money and with the economy and all sorts of stuff. So my dream is, is if you can't have a design ops person on your team, learn what design ops is, see how you can implement it in different areas and make sure that we're taking the load off of the designers as much as possible. Is there anything we as a service design community could do to help you get closer to that wish? Keep spreading the word. Keep talking about it. Keep talking about the fact that designers are struggling with too much on their plate and are asked to do too many roles. Keep showing that if there is a world where somebody else was to help these designers, these designers could move faster. If there were processes in place, instead of the stop, go, stop, go, stop, go, products could be built faster. Things could move faster. Things could launch faster. Companies could make more money. Like, people wouldn't it, have to burn out. People wouldn't have to burn out. So I think, I think just as an industry as a whole is making sure to keep the conversation going and keep the conversation going in the right place. Not that like, you know, jobs are in flux, things are happening. That's like, that is happening. That's, that's inevitable. Jobs are always going to come and go. We can't control the economy. We can't control a lot of that stuff, but we can control the narrative. And we can control how we educate our leaders and what we share with them and how they can help lead better teams. If people get curious and want to have this conversation, um, what are some resources uh, you'd point them to? Well, there's the Design Ops Assembly, which is the Slack channel that I run and the community I run. You can go to designopsassembly.com, press the join button, and someone will welcome you into the community as long as you are not a recruiter or a salesperson or a biz dev person. Um, so that's one way is keep going on the conversations. I think, you know, other things that are happening is there's a lot of great, strong voices out there talking right now. Um, Kristen Skinner is doing a talk about this, you know, very similar thing right now. She's, she's running all sorts of programs. Rachel Poseman and John Calhoun are coming out with a design ops book very, very soon. Keep your eyes peeled on that. You know, there's, you know, Kate Tozy's coming out with a research ops book also very soon. And so there are a lot of folks building a lot of really great resources right now. And I'm just skimming the surface in terms of what's happening. But keep your eyes out for them. And, um, you know, they're all going to be having conversations. There's the Design Ops Summit that Lou Rosenfeld does every year. Go to it. Talk on it. Like, you know, pitch a talk. Do that stuff. There's so many different things that you can do to kind of not only stay involved and learn more about this, but um, just be a part of the community. We'll make sure to add all the links in the show notes. And if people um, would like to continue the conversation with you once you have uh, re-emerged from config, what are some, are there any places they can follow you? Uh, LinkedIn, maybe. Uh, I'm trying to get back more into Twitter, but... Um, other than that, I'm pretty much just on the, on the Design Ops Slack channel and available um, when I can be. But uh, like everything, give me some grace. I uh, <laughs> just started a new job. Um, so my world is kind of, you know, learning everything that needs to happen. So things are uh, a little wild right now, but they'll calm down. Really? Thanks. Um, I'm so happy to always address design ops here on the service design show. I think our two communities um, should collaborate and partner way, way more than we're doing. I agree. Uh, yeah. So uh, anything that I can do to help and spread the awareness and address this topic, uh, I'm happy to. So I'm going to look forward to the people you suggest uh, to uh, getting more design ops friends on the show here uh, for now. I really appreciate you taking the time for coming on. Again, I know how packed your days are uh, with work, dogs, and podcasts. It was such podcasts. an honor to be here. So thank you for having me. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you for being on. And that almost wraps up our conversation with Meredith. What an inspiring reminder that design ops isn't just about streamlining processes or tools. It's about fostering genuine human connection and collaboration. Meredith's approach to building relationships, both within Figma 
and across the wider design community is a testament to the power of empathy and understanding in our field. Again, I feel it's a good reminder for all of us, whether you're a seasoned design professional or just starting out on your journey. So let's take Meredith's advice to heart. Reach out to your colleagues and build those bridges. Once again, a massive thank you to Meredith for sharing her insights and experience with us today. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, you can do me one big favor. Click the like button on this video if you haven't done so already. Not to feed the YouTube algorithm, I don't care about that, but to let me know whether or not we are on the right track by addressing topics like this. Finally, before we part ways, please take a moment to reflect and celebrate that by joining us today, you've directed your attention towards learning and growing as a professional. So from everyone who you are going to impact through your work, thank you for taking the time and making the commitment. My name is Mark Fontaine, and I look forward to having you with us again for a new conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.